I'll be presenting some of my research on the pre-stress losses of pretension BFIP reinforced concrete beams. Reinforced concrete is an incredibly versatile, affordable, and widely available structural material. However, the durability of reinforced concrete structures is often jeopardized by corrosion of steel reinforcement, which is causing millions of pounds in damage to the infrastructure. This is an especially large concern in coastal areas and other severe environments. To address this issue, one line of research has looked at using fiber reinforced polymers, composite materials with demonstrated excellence in automotive and airspace industries. The appeal of these materials lies mainly in their excellent strength to weight ratio and corrosion resistance, among other benefits. The most recent type of FRP, basalt fiber reinforced polymer, has attracted attention as a more sustainable and affordable alternative. The benefits of using this material are, of course, not limited to embodied emissions. The tensile tests we have conducted as well show that the bars can achieve a tensile capacity in excess of 1,200 megapascals, while at the same time having a density which is around three times lower than that of steel. However, the young modulus of uh, BFRP bars is around uh, 40 to 45 gigapascal. This presents a major challenge for application as internal reinforcement. As we can see here in these two photos, BFRP reinforced elements suffer from large deflections and more intensive cracking. So even though the ultimate load bearing capacity is much greater than for steel RC beams, the governing criteria for the design is always serviceability limit states, which is resulting in a poor utilization of uh, material capacity and inefficient design. So in order to address this issue, pre-stressing has emerged as a viable method. Here in these photos and the low deflection graph on the left side, we can see a comparison of flexural behavior of uh, unpre-stressed and pre-stressed BFIP reinforced beams. Analyzing the results at, for example, the span over 250 limit, we can demonstrate that around 70 to 80% increase in load bearing capacity is possible, even using low levels of pre stressing around 30 to 40% of the ultimate tensile capacity of the bars. However, while there is significant research to support the idea of mild pre stressing, the area is under investigated in the aspect of long term behavior and especially in the aspect of pre stress losses. This is an important design parameter, which is influenced by various factors, as we know, such as shrinkage of concrete, elastic shortening, relaxation of tendons. It is therefore the main of this research project to clarify the causes and quantify factors affecting losses of pre-stress of BFRP pretension beams and their effect on the flexural behavior. The project is a combination of experimental and theoretical approach through finite element modeling and numerical analysis. We tested so far 15 samples, and the dimensions of the first series was uh, 1.9 meters long beams with a cross section of 125 by 200 millimeters. The second series we produced had shorter samples in order to simulate the production line of two samples on a single pre stressing bed, the layout of which is shown in this sketch at the bottom of the slide. We have also investigated the influence of different concrete strengths, as the initial samples we produced with lower strength concrete showed signs of cracking in the pre-stress transfer zone. In terms of instrumentation, all of the bars were equipped with five strain gauges each, which allowed us to monitor the deformations continuously throughout all of these experimental phases. So in terms of testing, the samples were either monitored in an unloaded state or subjected to sustained loading for up to six months using the rig we developed, which is shown on the left-hand side picture. In the end, all samples were also subjected to a standard quasi-static four-point bending test until failure to assess the flexural behavior and the residual uh, capacity. So let's now take a look at some of the results of the project. Monitoring of the strain levels in the bars allows us to characterize the phasal change in the level of pre-stress. The first distinctive phase, labeled A on the graph, demonstrates a very steep drop of initial strain, around 0.08% per hour. The portion of the losses uh, can be recovered by readjustment of the pre-stress level, as this occurs before casting of the concrete and therefore is not significant. 
The following phase, phase B, describes the process of concrete curing, during which the losses are largely influenced by shrinkage of concrete. This cumulatively attributed for around 1.6% of decrease that we measured in total. The value is, of course, dependent on the properties of concrete itself and can be limited by prudent design of the concrete mix to limit shrinkage. The next important phase occurs at the transfer of pre-stress force from external anchorage to the concrete, which is causing the concrete to elastically deform, shortening the bar and therefore reducing the strain and stress in the bar itself. This is represented on the graph by a sudden drop that we can see on the left-hand side. In this stage, we uh, also analyze the influence of concrete strength and the initial pre-stress levels. The results, which we can see in this graph in the bottom right corner, show that the higher the pre-stress level, the higher is the loss, and the lower the concrete strength, the higher is the loss, which is unsurprising. Afterwards, we apply a numerical approach based on Eurocode 2 to calculate elastic shortening losses. The equation was just slightly modified to represent material properties of BFRP and actual conditions the samples were in at the time of release. The results of theoretical calculations are here uh, plotted on the graph against the experimental ones, and as we can see, there is a satisfactory correspondence. The final phase of monitoring shown here consisted of six months under sustained loading. The dominating factors in this phase are geological properties of concrete as well as potential relaxation of the bars, which depends on the other factors. The results which are shown on the bottom right graph, show a very small change in the level of strain for all samples. Additionally, the level of sustained loading does not appear to have an influence. However, looking at the top right graph, the final losses were, of course, in total higher for samples with a higher initial pre-stress. Finally, the results of the four-point bending test to failure are shown here on a low deflection graph. The graphs follow a typical bilinear pattern where the point of the change of the slope, indicated here, represents the opening of the first crack. Interestingly, the level of applied, applied sustained loading does not appear to have an influence on the flexural behavior, which we can judge from the pairs of samples, suggesting a favorable retention of structural capacity over time. The samples we then uh, were modeled using ANSYS, and the models were validated against the experimental results, which are shown here in comparison for three of the models. We observed more than satisfactory correspondence, especially in the first non-cracked stage with very good prediction of the opening of the first crack. The crack stage proved somewhat more difficult to accurately model, but the prediction of the final deflection was always within a 10% tolerance, and so was the load prediction. To summarize, the motivation behind this project is to offer an alternative, more sustainable and affordable solution for structures in aggressive environments or with equipment sensitive to electromagnetic interference. Through experimental and theoretical approach, this research project provides more clarity for design of mild pre-stress BFIP elements, bringing them closer to implementation in design codes. Future work hopefully will offer a more commercially viable anchorage solution and optimize manufacturing process to enable the path of BFRP from the rock mines to the construction site. Thanks to NVIDIA and Magmatech, and thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Um, it's very interesting. I have a, a first quick question, um, which was, um, what happens after six months? You had a lot of testing up to six months, but as a as a practicing design engineer, I'm sort of thinking, well, you know, my structure might be there for 50 years, 120 years. Uh, have your sort of models of work to date sort of suggested, you know, can we extrapolate what might happen in that period? Um, what should we be doing in that period? Is, are we concerned about further losses in that period? Yes, thank you. That's That's a very good question. Uh, initially, the testing was planned for an even shorter period, and uh, because we, we had the capacity to do it, we prolonged it to six months. Uh, but as we observed no change in the deflections in this period, and neither in the strain levels in the bars, we decided to terminate the testing as uh, we can extrapolate then the results, as you, as you mentioned, 
to uh, find what will be a prediction for a real service life capability because uh, 100 year testing, of course, is not uh, practical for lab testing. Thank you. Um, I'll go to uh, Dennis, please, for a question. Uh, hi, Anna. Um, just want to know what is the mode of failure of your specimen? I mean, we can see from the curve you've got a straight drop in terms of loading. I just want to know, you haven't shown us, what is the mode? Is it a concrete failure or is it a rupture of the, um, you know, a basal bar or what is the mode of failure in your experiment? Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, the beams were designed uh, as under reinforced beams uh, with the balance reinforcement under the balance reinforcement ratio to fail by FRP rupture. So uh, the failure of all the specimens were, was indeed by rupture of the bars. If we were to make uh, over reinforced elements with a larger percentage of reinforcement, uh, we would achieve uh, concrete crushing, which is recommended. Uh, design for uh, using FRP as internal reinforcement, for example, in the FIB technical build bulletin. So the, the rupture occur at mid-span, roughly, yeah? Roughly at the mid-span, yes, that's correct. Thank you. We have a question from the audience, uh, which is, have you considered creep rupture of BFRP? Um, yes, um, thank you for this question. This is indeed a very uh, important uh, area for application of FRP, and it's a large concern, for example, for GFRP, which has been in use for many more years than uh, BFRP. And uh, we have conducted our independent tests of uh, creep testing in the laboratories, which is currently still ongoing. Uh, however, there is completed research by a team of scientists from, I be believe, uh, it, it's a university in China, I'm really sorry, I can't remember the name. Uh, they have concluded that the, uh, uh, that the creep rupture, there is no, no uh, risk of creep rupture for levels of pre-stressing under 52%. Whereas we are working with levels which are uh, quite lower than that, 20, 30, or up to 40. However, we have tested some samples as well with 60%, and we had uh, absolutely no indication of creep rupture. Okay, thank you. And um, I think we've got time for a, a perhaps the last question uh, from Eleni, please, from my colleague. Uh, hi, Anna. Um, my question is. Um, a bit, I guess, more generic. So there are so many types of FRPs. Uh, do you have a sense of, um, for example, if BFRPs behave better in terms of uh, creep effects or relaxation effects uh, compared with GFRPs or CFRPs? Uh Yes, thank you. So the advantage of BFRP is uh, well, normally compare it to GFRP as they're more similar uh, in terms of their properties. So they have a BFRP has a better resistance to alkaline corrosion, which is an issue for GFRP as uh, internal reinforcement in concrete, which is, of course, an alkaline environment. In terms of creep, it tends to behave similar or better than GFRP. Thank you. I, I had one last question. I think we've got just a minute before we go to the break. Um, it's sort of a wider one. You know, basalt reinforcement looks very, you know, very promising, and some interesting uh, test results and, and work that you're doing. Um, for those listening on the call now, if they were thinking, well, you know, maybe I could go away and think about designing something with with uh, basalt bars in. Uh, you know, could could people be uh, using pre-stressed basalt now? Uh, is, how, how far do you think there is to go before this this kind of work can get codified or into design guides? Uh, so uh, FIB group is currently working on the implementation of FRP as internal reinforcement, and there is discussion of including uh, pre-stressing of FRP as well in the code, which will in the end be uh, included in the Eurocode update. Uh, it's already, there is design guidance in the American code for design with FRP and pre-stressed FRP. Basalt, of course, being a new material, is uh, actually mentioned in the uh, American code. 
However, explicitly the values are normally, the recommendations are not normally given for basalt. So it is still a bit uh, away from being able to design with it just now, which is what uh, I'm hoping will happen in the future.